Hey guys, Dr. Sam here helping you get closer to great skin. Now I saw two patients in clinic this week that compelled me to do this video. Both were cases of acne that was not acne. So in the first instance, a patient had been misdiagnosed, given oral antibiotics, and despite numerous months of treatment had not got better. And the problem was affecting her face. The second was someone with acne on the face that was given oral antibiotics that then developed acne on the body. So when is acne not acne? Well, it's when there's an infection in the follicles by a bug called malassezia, or what it used to be known as pterosporum. And this is not a bacteria, it's a yeast. Now this particular yeast is on all of our skins all the time, but it flourishes in humid conditions and in oily follicles. So typically our skin becomes colonized around the time of puberty when those hormones switch on our oil glands and we get T-zone changes, combination skin, possibly some acne as well. So what's happening that we misdiagnose it as acne? So acne itself is a process that is primarily comedonal in origin. So it's also a disease of too much oil, but the primary lesion is a comedone. So blackheads and whiteheads. Downstream of those comedones, you tend to get inflammatory lesions, which are red bumps, what we call papules, pustules, which are red bumps with white tops on the heads, nodules and cysts. And you often get any number of different inflammatory lesions with acne at any one time. And I think the really key finding with adult female acne is the tendency for it to affect the lower face. Now let's switch over to fungal acne. This tends to cause tiny, what we call monomorphic, which basically means that they all look the same. So not this variation that you see in acne where you get these papules or pustules or nodules and cysts, which all look different to each other. So these are tiny monomorphic lesions. And they tend to affect areas, again, where there's lots of oil glands, but in clinic, I tend to see people with issues on the forehead and the temples. So lots of these tiny little red, dotted lesions scattered over those oilier parts of the skin. On the body, it can tend to affect the V of the chest and the same on the back, the areas again where the oil glands are most dense. What can complicate matters further is that it may well exist in context of another skin problem like acne, like seborrheic dermatitis, which is also triggered by the same yeast or even rosacea. So first things first, make the diagnosis. So when someone comes in to see me in the clinic, the first thing I do is to examine their history and their medications for anything that might contain a triggering factor. So if they've had acne medications that contain antibiotics or they've had oral antibiotics, sometimes for something completely unrelated, um, to make sure that we get rid of that in the first instance. That will then allow the natural flora balance to reset so that instead of killing off all the healthy bacteria, which allows the yeast to overgrow, the healthy bacteria can rise up and reestablish a healthy microbiome. The next thing I'll do is to treat with an oral antifungal agent. I tend to use fluconazole. Um, this gives the speediest resolution of problems. And usually by the time someone has got to me, things are quite extensive or significant or have been present for some time. So we want rapid resolution of their symptoms. The azole group of medications can sometimes cause tummy upset and are broken down by the liver. So it's important to take a good history and ensure the patient is suitable for this kind of medication. The next thing I'll do is to look at their skincare and to make sure they're not using any topical facial oils, which might encourage growth of this yeast even further. I tend to recommend products like Aven moisturizers. So their Tolerance Extrema Emulsion is a favorite as is the Aven Recovery Cream Light and a bland, unfragranced, preservative-free cleanser like La Roche-Posay Tularian Domo Cleanser. I'll then see that patient probably four to six weeks later to assess response to treatment and to think about maintenance. Um, some patients will need to go on to use a topical antifungal wash. I tend to use something like ketoconazole, which is known as Nizaral. And using that three times a week on the skin, allowing it to sit for a couple of minutes can just help lower the natural amount of yeast that exists on the skin and reduce the risk of triggering a relapse. And relapse is unfortunately quite common this condition. 
Other things to think about are once we've treated the fungal acne, is there any other pathology that needs treatment? As I said before, it's not uncommon for this to coexist with ordinary acne vulgaris. They're both diseases of the oil glands after all. So it may well be that a retinoid or azelaic acid or some benzoyl peroxide needs to be added into the mix once the first problem has resolved. So I hope that's made it seem clearer how to diagnose fungal acne, what the differences are when it compared to regular acne, and how to go about getting a handle on it. Bye for now.